DC News Now presents Veterans Voices, sponsored by Wounded Warrior Project. Hello, I'm Liberty Zavala and welcome to Veterans Voices. In the next 30 minutes, we will share the stories of local veterans right here in the DMV from beating the odds to making change and keeping final promises. To start, she's a DC National Guard member by day and a family law attorney by night. This is the story of how Master Sergeant Ismari Ramos Medina not only protects our local airspace, but uses what little spare time she has to fight for domestic violence victims in the DMV. Good morning. Her voice is a soothing sense of calm for domestic violence victims. Have there been any instances where there have been any altercations? Um, have they hit you? Ismari Ramos Medina represents them pro bono for the DC Volunteer Lawyers Project. When we finish this conversation, we are gonna give you all the information you need. Originally from Puerto Rico, Ismari is no ordinary lawyer. On top of her duties fighting for domestic violence victims in the DMV, she fights to defend our local airspace. What I specifically do is be on alert and we dispatch. We give that initial notification to the pilots and maintainers to dispatch F-16s to see if anybody, if there's a threat in the airspace. Once the F-16s take flight. After we do that part, they're the ones that go in the air and they make sure that there are no threats similar to what happened in September 11 that would happen again in this area. Her sharpness, tenacity, and strength in this role translates for her victims in the courtroom. Es muy frustrante, pues a veces ni duermes pensando. It helped her fight for her client Maria to gain custody of her son. It's very fulfilling that I can do this for these victims and survivors because they are truly alone when they are facing these problems. Ismari and the DC Volunteer Lawyers Project fought hard for Maria and her son and won. Y pues me sentí aliviada, sentí que hasta la lotería me gané. Me sentí muy apoyada, sabiendo que tengo alguien que me está apoyando. Y pues cualquier cosa que pasaba, ella me comunicaba. And Master Sergeant Ramos Medina says her role as a lawyer also helps bring her humanity to the uniform. Being a lawyer requires a lot of research and discipline, organization, and I think those skills can also be brought to being a command post controller. The training that I have from the Air Force is more hands-on. You don't have to think so much, you just do it and you follow orders. However, we also have to take into consideration the component that we are people. And to be a senior NCO, you have to relate to your peers, you have to relate to the airmen. And that empathy from being a lawyer also transmits into the Air Force and the community that we are. Now a Marine Corps veteran returns to his alma mater after serving his country for decades. Now he's making a difference in the lives of young men just like him at the Annapolis Naval Academy as a football coach. DC News Now's Yamari Sase shows us how he leads them on the field and off. I wouldn't change a thing. Moving hundreds of miles away from Georgia and choosing to attend the United States Naval Academy wasn't Robert Greene's first choice. So my mother was the primary reason uh, why I chose the Naval Academy in the beginning. Yet it was one of the best decisions he's ever made. As I grew here, as I gained friends, I, I fell in love with the place. Green was recruited to play a sport he loved, football. My class was one of the first uh, of, of, uh, of many that helped you know, get the program on board. Not so much success in my earlier years. Um, reached some success in my senior year. I went to a bowl game, won that bowl game in Hawaii, and it was the time of our lives. After graduating from the academy as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, he traveled the world serving his country while working his way up as a lieutenant colonel. From California, Indianapolis, Georgia, to Japan and Afghanistan, he says it gave him a new perspective on life. You see uh, some younger kids out hunting for water, food every day, and you really kind of gain a perspective on life that most, most Americans don't really share. 
right? And so when I came back, I found it difficult coming back because I had lived such a simple life for nine months or a year or seven months. Uh, and when I got back and you see people, you know, arguing about political opinions or who's the greatest, LeBron or Michael, and it's just like, what, what are we doing as arguing for? I've actually seen life, uh, people who really have real problems. Another lesson you learn, to never give up. I think that's the, that's the biggest thing I gained from my time in, uh, deployed in the, in the Marine Corps is that um, the mission will be, get accomplished one way or the other, uh, and you will find a way to get it done. There's no quit. So, uh, and I, I brought that back here, and I, and I think that has served me well. Now he's taking those lessons he learned in life and his career and building up the next generation through football. I have found, I think, what my purpose is in life, uh, and it's to help this. Every generation that comes through here, if I can help in a way to make them better people uh, in the end, uh, then that's, that's my mission. Green landed a job as an assistant coach at the very school he started, the U.S. Naval Academy. I get to coach football at our alma mater. I get to coach my position that I played here, and I get to, to go out every day and develop the next generation of Marines and sailors, and, uh, and I can ask for a better spot to be in. Oh! Oh! Give me 10. Some days are like a wild man out there running around um, because I'm chasing them around the field and trying to make sure that they're doing, their, doing things right with detail, uh, and I'm having so much fun doing it. But to him, it's the importance of being a mentor. I, I talk to the guys all the time about, about those things, about what's important, about why all these little things that the Naval Academy asks you to do are so important and how they'll serve you uh, later on in life. And I try to apply those lessons uh, and give them uh, real life examples so that they can understand you know, that the haircut is not just about the haircut, right? it's about you know, <laughs> the details and doing things right. Uh, and, 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 and why being on time or being early uh, uh, is super important. So uh, d just those, those life lessons, I think, um, uh, try to help these guys understand what I hear. He's realizing a decision influenced by his mother was one of the best choices he's ever made. Now as a coach. The greatest joy is to hear a thanks. Like, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, that you didn't give up on me and that you gave me a shot. And so now I'm starting to get that. Now I'm saying this is now I'm starting to have uh, fun in this job because now I'm starting to see the fruits of our labor here. And as a veteran, I have a part of this country, uh, and nobody can take that away from me. I feel special because of that. I'm honored. Um, I have a stake in this country. I feel proud of my service, and um, it has provided my, me and my family. Uh, a way of life uh, that I could not have imagined when I was 18 and signed up for this deal. Reporting in Annapolis, Maryland, I'm Yama Marisa Say, DC News Now. Still ahead on Veterans Voices. Physically, I received the medal, but I also include those who have fought and died for America. We will introduce you to one of the last remaining Filipino World War II veterans in the DMV, still fighting to keep a promise. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. I'm Liberty Zabala. During World War II, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos joined the U.S. Armed Forces to fight side by side with Americans. They were promised veterans benefits, but that was later rescinded by Congress after the war. We now introduce you to one of the last remaining Filipino World War II veterans in the DMV still fighting for that promise. The occupation at that time was harsh. 96-year-old U.S. Navy veteran Remigio Kabakar remembers the violent rule of Japanese forces when they occupied the Philippines, his homeland, during World War II. Some of them go around small villages and uh, situate that people are obedient to the rule of the Japanese. If you did not, that's the end of your life. The Philippines was under attack, and after Pearl Harbor, President Franklin D. Roosevelt promised to defend the Philippines, which was an American commonwealth at the time. He called on Filipinos to help. I come from a poor family. That's why I was urged to join the Navy. Kabakar was among the tens of thousands of Filipinos who left their villages to answer the call. We walked 32 miles, and when we reached 
the destination. This American recruiter was at the gate shouting, who wants to join the Navy? I raised my hand. Filipinos gave life and limb fighting alongside Americans in the Battle of Bataan. When Japanese forces overpowered them, Filipinos were among the estimated 10,000 soldiers who died during the Bataan Death March. When the war broke out, I imagine that the first casualty was a Filipino and the blood spilled was for this country. Roosevelt's promise soon after was broken when Congress passed the Rescission Act, which ripped away the promise of benefits to Filipino fighters, their widows, and children. Why must we live behind? Why was the service that we rendered for America useless? Kabakar then picked up a decades-long fight for his fellow Filipino veterans to get the recognition they deserved and the benefits they'd been promised. Even protesting in marches on Washington as part of the veterans group, which later became the advocacy organization PhilVet Rep. We created PhilVet Rep uh, with a three-pronged mission. One was to get a congressional gold medal. PhilVet Rep and its partners worked tirelessly to finally get Congress to award some of these Filipino veterans with the congressional gold medal in 2017, 72 years after the war. It was really an honor. Physically, I received the medal, but I also include those who have fought and died for America. The recognition is the first step in getting them to get to be called veterans. Phil Vet Rep's second mission was to develop this education program called Duty to Country. No sacrifice and patriotism. That story is not going to be told unless we do this education project. And we committed ourselves to making sure that that story also becomes enshrined in American history. The third and final step is to repeal the Rescission Act. We formally started that process by meeting with Senator Hirono, Ms. Hirono, and provided her with the background on why we should repeal, provided her with a draft legislation for them to consider, and we were looking for a sponsor. Kabakar later retired and opened the Friendly Barber Shop in Fort Washington, Maryland, with many stories to tell. If you visit him, he will tell you how he served aboard minesweeping destroyer USS Thompson in the Korean War. He also served as a chef for five directors of the FBI. Everything that you have seen or witnessed here because of America. A legacy of service that lives on. I am still serving people to this day. The best I know how. And you can learn more about the history of World War II veterans and their fight by watching the Phil Vet Rep documentary at dutytocountry.org. Still ahead on Veterans Voices. There's only 5% of officers are women in the, in the service, in the Marine Corps, and that baffled me. And he also said, you know, you can be a leader right away. How this woman is sliding across the DMV to become the first female bobsledder in the U.S. Marine Corps. And later, how a Marine veteran went against the odds and took a challenge that almost seemed impossible. That story after the break. You're watching Veterans Voices. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. I'm Liberty Zabala. What does a Marine, pageant queen, and bobsledder have in common? Well, it's all one person. Captain Riley T. Jack, stationed right here in Quantico, Virginia, represents Team USA as the first female Marine bobsledder and tells us how she is now making her run for the Olympics. One, Can I get in the front? Two, three. Captain Riley T. Jack serves as a Marine Corps logistics officer responsible for moving supplies and people. We think of food, medical supplies, water, ammo, anything that anyone needs to support the warfighter. This morning, she's loading Marine students onto buses to study a nearby historic battlefield. You can get on now. She has served her country in the Marine Corps for nearly five years, drawn in by the opportunity 
abilities to lead and the physical and mental challenges. When I met a Marine recruiter for the first time, I was blown away by everything he had to say. There's only 5% of officers are women in the, in the service, in the Marine Corps, and that baffled me. And he also said, you know, you can be a leader right away. You can impact lives. You can be a change of a face for, as a woman. She has been a face inspiring and lifting up other women in the Marine Corps. But now she'll make another lift. The bobsledder for Team USA. I'd be a little bit adventurous uh, to be able to do a sport like this. She is the first U.S. Marine to represent Team USA in this sport that demands her intensity both mentally and physically. Oh, back there, ready? 80 to 90 miles an hour down an ice slope in freezing temperatures, getting like shaken around, crashing on your head, concussions, ice burn, the whole thing. But that's what draws her in. I'm chasing myself to get hundreds of a second faster. Tents will separate metals. I want to see what I can do with my body and my mind and just keep lifting up the ceilings for what women can, can really do. She often pushes herself beyond her comfort zones. She even competed in a pageant and was crowned Miss Military 2023. It's really cool to see, especially young, young girls look up to you and be like, wait a minute, like you look like a princess, but you're also in the military and like they can make that connection, which is what I'm trying to do is show people that you can do both. Her office is decorated with trophies and medals, but she says it's the failures you don't see. Or there's times in my last bobsled competition last season, you know, I was supposed to do really well, be a favorite to come in top three, and I crashed. I have a lot of success, and I think the reason why I'm so successful is because of all the failures I had. It just, people don't think that things are, have been hard, things haven't been difficult, and every day I fail in some capacity. And now she's training for her next goal, to represent USA in the Olympics. The Olympics is the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. I think I never thought that ever be possible for me. <laughs> and not that it's within a striking distance, it's doable. And to do that and be the first female Marine to do so would be something I can give back to my community and for women all around the world. Why that matters so much to me is not for my own story. It's for the hundreds of people I want behind me to do the same thing. Liberty Zabala, DC News Now. In 2021, a suicide bombing at the Kabul airport during the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan claimed the lives of 13 service members. Dozens more were injured. Marine veteran Tyler Vargas Andrews was so badly wounded, he's now a double amputee. But against all odds, he's here today and completed the Marine Corps Marathon. DC News Now's Haley Mylon tells us how he's honoring his fallen brothers and sisters. No one expects to get blown up, you know, no one expects to, or, you know, you think about dying when you're in the military, but you don't think like, oh man, I could be severely wounded for the rest of my life and, and completely change it. That's exactly what happened on August 26th, 2021, as Tyler Vargas Andrews and his platoon worked to evacuate U.S. allies from the Kabul airport. Also there, two of his closest friends, Staff Sergeant Darren Hoover and Corporal Hunter Lopez, assisting with an interpreter's family amid a chaotic crowd of people trying to flee the Taliban. Searching for the rest of their family members in the canal, one, one of the when the suicide bomber detonated directly across from us, uh, about three to five meters away. Vargas Andrews was flown away for treatment. As he underwent more than 40 surgeries, he says there were times it seemed he wouldn't make it. The Semper Fi and America's Fund stepped in, providing financial assistance, even flying his mother to his bedside. And, you know, she had to come in and say goodbye to me multiple times when I was dying. I mean, they, you know, they, they brought her in to do that. Tyler says despite extensive internal organ damage and the removal of his arm and his leg, his doctors were astounded by his survival, <sighs> attributing his resilience to his physical fitness, battling the psychological wounds, fitness has remained central to his life. His injuries not stopping him, but rather serving as the steam propelling him forward. Relearning to do just about everything with half his limbs, Tyler latched on to some profound sentiments. And I think that piece on resiliency for me is, you know, I, I was saying never, never a victim and I, I live and breathe that. Tyler says he knows other wounded veterans, some with no limbs at all, who are still grateful to be alive. You know, what's your excuse? 
Tyler completed the Marine Corps Marathon on his recumbent bike, all 50 kilometers carrying with him the names of his fallen brothers and sisters on his wrist. And he did it, benefiting the very organization that gave him comfort in the face of death. Uh, the December 5 Fund was there every step of the way, you know, supporting not just financially, but being there as a friend and, and, and family now. Providing Tyler with an adaptive truck, bike, ramps for his home, making sure his mother had the support she needed as she supported Tyler through it all. He says the fund has helped his friends' families too in the face of unthinkable loss. He says the pain and the exhaustion of racing is nothing to him when he remembers his why. I'm thinking of my buddies who aren't there anymore, and you know, I'm like, man, this, this sucks, but... You know what sucks worse is, is, is them not being here and uh, you know, I, I get to do it for them. In Arlington, Haley Mylon, DC News Now. And we'll wrap things up right after the break. You're watching Veterans Voices on DC News Now. Stay with us. Thank you for watching Veterans Voices. As a journalist who has covered the military for more than a decade and as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve, it is truly an honor to share with you the stories of the men and women who have served our great nation and the stories of those who continue to serve till this day. I'm Liberty Zabala. We salute you.